Kalir doshini de rajan asti eko mahagun. Kirtana eva krishna sya mukta sangam parambaja. This is a verse spoken by Srila Sukadev Goswami to Maharaj Pariksit, which is mentioned in the 12th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, where he's describing that in this present age, and this is just at the beginning of the age of Kali, he's already describing Kalir Dosha Nidi. Dosha means false, and Nidi means ocean. Well, this in age, there is so many faults. We see it everywhere around us. We also experience it in our own personal lives. And it's sometimes as hard as we try to get around it or avoid it or somehow solve it, it comes back in one form or another. It's just the way this age is. It's the dark age of mankind, the age of Kali. <clears throat> But because the Lord is very kind and very merciful, he gives us a way to rise above all of this. And that is his personal presence in the form of transcendental sound. That transcendental sound is coming from the spiritual world. Golokera primadana harinam sankirtan ratinjan milokena upai. That this chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra is not coming from anywhere in this material realm, from the highest planet to the lowest planet or in between. It is not part of anything of the created existence. It's coming from the pure spiritual essence. And that is, it's coming from the heart of the Supreme Lord Himself. And He makes that mercy, or you may say that process available in this age so easy and so direct and so, as we already experienced it tonight, so very joyful. It's not only a process for keeping away and pushing back the difficulties of this age, but it's a process for purifying our existence and experience the greatest form of happiness that is available to the conditioned souls in this age. So in this verse, it explains that it's a very, without going in through all the details, it's a very dark age. But there's a bright light that can dissipate the entire darkness very easily. If you have one bright light in the midst of darkness, then the darkness is no longer seen. And that bright light is the mercy of the Lord in the form of His holy name. Throughout the scriptures, both in the Shrutis and in the Smritis, the Shrutis are actually the Vedas itself. The four Vedas, the Upanishads, these are the Shrutis. And the Smritis are the commentaries on the Vedas which explain the Shrutis in a very, when we say, more understandable way for the people, and especially in this age. And both of these contexts of the spiritual knowledge that's available glorifies the holy name above everything else. <laughs> a little bit of a research as Lord Brahma him says, Iti Soda Sakam Nam Nam, Kali Kama Sanasana, Nata Paratayo Payo, Veda Sarva Veda Shudrashuti. After searching through all the Vedas, one cannot find a more direct, sublime, and easy process of self-realization in this age than chanting these 16 names. Iti Sodasakam, Sodasakam means 16. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare. And that mercy has been manifested personally by the Supreme Lord Himself as He appeared in this age as Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, along with His associates to demonstrate how that process goes on. Not only did the Lord teach it, but He also showed how the process works, which is really 
the ultimate principle of mercy. When the essence comes to teach the essence and demonstrates the essence in his own personal uh, activities, can't get any better form of mercy than that. It's direct. So this chanting, now as we were explaining that this particular weekend we're going to explore eight very powerful verses. And I say powerful because they're spoken by the Supreme Lord himself, Sri Krishna Chaitanya. When, some, when, the, when people speak about the Lord, you may find some reason to question or doubt. But when the Lord speaks about himself, <laughs> then there's no, the, the principles are absolute. The only, th the only thing we have to do is try to understand it and apply it. So, and Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, although he was here for 48 years, he only wrote those eight verses, that's all. That was towards the end of his, his sojourn in this material world. At the very end, when he was going into his ecstasies as for love of God, in his internal mood, because Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is in the mood of Srimati Radharani. <clears throat> Sri Krishna Chaitanya Radha Krishna Nohyonya. That same Radharani in Vrindavan, who is the pleasure potency, the internal energy of the Lord, manifests herself in the mood of love for himself in his pastimes of worshiping himself in her mood. It's really pretty, as you might say, inconceivable. <laughs> That's probably the word, it's inconceivable. So in these eight verses, the entire process of pure devotional service is encased. And that might seem to be a little bit of an overstatement, but the Acharyas, especially Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, and others, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, have commented on these eight verses. And His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhakti Vedanta Swami Prabhupada, has said that the six Goswamis are pretty much the foundation by which we get all of our knowledge for the practice of devotional service. Sri Rupa Sanatan Bhattaragunath, Sri Jiva Gopal Bhatt Das Raghunath. The entire, these six Goswamis heard directly from Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and wrote it down in, you might say, Unlimited amount of verses, just Jiva Goswami alone wrote 400,000 verses. Just, and you know, it's not easy to write in those days. We got the pen and paper, and we, don't even, we think that's too hard, so we go on the computer, and we think that's a little bit easier. And then now they got, you could even speak it, and then and, and the names come, and you know. Pretty soon they're gonna say it for you. <laughs> so. We do is plug in, yes, I want to hear this. So you got that already. But they, they had palm leaves from trees. They dried them out. And then when they were dried out at a certain point, they had these like, I don't know, it was, it's, it's like a, a tiny needle. It's like a pen, but it's got a, a needle. And they scratched them the Sanskrit into the palm leaves. And then only after some time, then they would get the, get the ink and put it on the palm leaf, smear it in, and then the ink would go into the crevices of the writings. And after some time, they would dry. And then you would have your Shastra. 400,000 verses just by Jiva Goswami. <laughs> Can you imagine what arduous work that was? But they were, for them it was a great pleasure to glorify the Lord by putting this information available for all of us from time immemorial. And as Srila Prabhupada culminates the, the principles, he simply says, all 
He doesn't use some, he says all of the books of the Goswamis were written on these eight verses. That's pretty powerful. Just those eight verses alone have expanded into, you say, hundreds and hundreds of transcendental books of, tra of knowledge that is perfect and pure and can bring one self-realization by simply by reading it, applying it, and uh, study, study, reading it, studying it, and applying it. So everything is there in these eight verses. So I'll take a little time. This, this particular presentation is not the beginning of the seminar. The seminar begins tomorrow. Um, I will speak on verse number one and two. And Bhuta Bhavara Prabhu, who is a fantastic speaker, those of you who had exposure to him, he takes the most simplest philosophy and turns it into the most interesting presentation with so many different realizations. He will speak on verse 3, 4, 5, and 6. And then I'll, we'll conclude with verse 7 and 8. And so today we're just going to give a little indication of what these eight verses comprise of. The Vedas explain that all knowledge is put into three categories. Sambandha, Abhideya, Prayojana. Sambandha simply means relations. What is the conditioned soul's relationship with different aspects of existence? What is our relationship with God? What is our relationship with this body that we have? What is our, what, when I, mean I say what, what is the proper, according to Shastra and transcendental perfection of knowledge, what is the proper way to understand these, these relationships? It's not just a matter of connecting, it's a matter of connecting in the way that perfects that connection. It's like you might say, we all look for perfection in, in relationships. Of course, in this age, it's very difficult to come to that position because of the nature of the age. But that's what everyone aspires for. But the, the principle of Sambandha teaches the perfection. What is our relationship with the spiritual master? What is our relationship with the devotees who are more advanced, who are on the same level? or on a lesser platform? What is our relationship with this material energy, the earth itself? This is a very large topic, extremely large. The three modes of material nature and the de details of the different features of each of the three modes. So it's an unlimited source of transcendental topics that have been explained. And once one has foundation, and this is the, in developing a relationship with a particular aspect of existence, one can become perfect in that. So ultimately, what is our relationship with Krishna? <laughs> we can explain it, but then there are so many aspects to it that needs to be re-explained and also practiced and fine-tuned according to time, place, and circumstance. Ultimately, our relationship with Krishna is that we jivair sarupai krishna nityadas. We are his eternal servant. We have so many identities that we deal with. We have identities we have with other types of people who see us and according to how that relationship plays, that plays out. Just like friends, family members, people in general, and within that, people in general, different aspects of society. So we have different identities. But all of these are ephemeral in the sense that they're temporary. They come and go and they have a purpose in this material world. But then we have this eternal, eter eternal identity where we are connected to Krishna continuously, even while we are under the influence of the material energy. Even if we're not even aware of our connection with Krishna, we're still connected. <laughs> the awareness doesn't change the connection, nor does it minimize the connection, or does it lessen the connection. The connection is always there. 
it's just a matter of consciousness to bring back the understanding of what how that connection is and to what we say the next step is to work on developing that connection and that's called abhideya that's the process that's the process of pure devotional service so sambandha relationships abhideya the activities that formulate those relationships especially particularly our relationship with the supreme lord and the last part of the Vedic knowledge is the smallest but the most important part and that is called prayojana. And prayojana means what is, the, what is the goal of that relationship. Some people think, well, God is there, I'm here, he's got everything, I'm lacking, my relationship with him is to ask him for what I need. Yeah, it's the parent, the, the ch child to parent relationship. The child expects, the parent gives, like that, the child asks. And then when it, as the parent, child grows up, expect to ask less and less and becomes a parent and he takes the part of giving to his children like that. But that is not actually the essential principle of the relationship, nor does it give satisfaction. The ultimate principle is the principle by which existence is perfected, and that is to please the Lord. So the activities we perform are meant to our prayers, our activities, our behavior. All of that is meant to be an offering to the Lord in a way that is pleasing to the Lord. And the Lord is very kind, and then he's, sometimes they say he's easily pleased, but then at other times it says that he's not so easily pleased. <laughs> Which means it's, it's based not so much on the activity that you do, it's based on the motivation of your activity. Whether you're trying to gain something or trying to give something, then that's, that makes the activity completely opposite. So the idea is, just like Prabhupada would always say, sometimes in many religions they ask God, please give me, you know, Dehi, Dehi, Dehi. Dehi means give me. My Lord, please give me, and then you can put so many, you know, endings on it. Give me a good husband, good wife, make my children, you know, get good marks in school, give me, you know, a good job, so many things. Or give me good health, give me good energy, give me long life, you know, it, it just goes on. So this Dehi mood is not very attractive to the Lord because he's giving anyway. <laughs> Whether you know it or not, he's giving. And even if you don't ask, you usually get what you need if you make a little endeavor in that direction, that's all. He fulfills that generally. But what we're, asked, what we're trying to do is find out what pleases you, my Lord. Just like Prabhupada would say. Some religions, they say, my dear Lord, give us our daily bread. They're asking for nourishment, nutrition, food. And we say, my dear Lord, what would you like to eat today? That's the difference between bhakti and karma. What would you like? Or Prabhupada, to take it a little bit into the area of Vrindavan, he would say, to look into Krishna's lunch pail and to see what Mother Yasoda has given him for lunch today. That's the greatest happiness. <laughs> so these are ways that we have to understand that approaching to Lord is really about thinking how to please the Lord. That's, that's really what bhakti is all about. And that's not so difficult as long as, but there's an art that comes to that. And that art is learning about the Lord. 
the more we know about him, the more we get attracted to him because he's all attractive. <laughs> his name is that, Krishna. That one, that person who can attract everyone. So these three principles, Sambandha, Avideya, and Prayojana, make up the process of these eight prayers. And I'll, I'll mention how that works. Let me see here. The, uh, well actually, Sambandha is in verse number one, verse number two, verse number three, verse number four, and number five. These five verses teach the process of Sambandha relationships. Verse number six, seven, and eight teach the goal, Prayojana. And all of them, all eight verses teach Abhideya, the process. So that's, this, that's mentioned by Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. The process of Bhakti is a science. You'll hear from Bhutta Bhavana Prabhu, he'll give you a, really a deep understanding of this science of Bhakti and how it works. When we say science, it sounds a little bit ephemeral, it sounds like something outside of the spiritual realm. It sounds like something that you, you, you learn in school by books. But science really means a process by which a certain result is desired and given if the science is followed accordingly. And what is that science? The science is to awaken, and this is a very important part, to awaken the natural love we have for Krishna. It's there, but it's covered. So these verses glorify the process of awakening that process, that, that, that love of God which is there within the heart. And verses 6, 7, and 8 describe the mood of ecstatic, loving, devotional service. Now, everything centers around one point, the holy name. <laughs> the holy name is the whole process itself. Those who study and practice and reach a certain level of practice of devotional service understand that the essence of bhakti is to glorify the Lord by chanting the holy name of the Lord. There are devotees who are on such high platforms, that's all they do. They don't do anything else. They just chant. Because they've come to that platform where they've gone through all of the stages of bhakti and come to the realization that the, the chanting of the holy name is the essence and the perfection of devotional service. And it's the easiest. <laughs> That's the most amazing thing about this whole process. It's easy. But is it easy? No. <laughs> I just said it was easy, now I'm saying no. Boy, what a bogus guru. <laughs> he says one thing and then he changes. <laughs> It's easy for those who seriously take it up, and it's difficult for those who don't. <laughs> seriously means with the desire to achieve the perfection. And it's a process. In these eight verses, that process is nicely given. Adao Shraddha, Sadhu Sangha, Bhajana Kriya, Anartha Nivritti, Nishta, Ruchi, Ashati, Bhava, and ultimately Prema. Sadhana Bhakti, Bhava Bhakti, Prema Bhakti. We hear about these three categories. They're all mentioned by Srila Rupa Goswami in detail in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindha, also by Bhakti Vinod Thakur and Jaiva Dharma. And other charyas have also addressed these subject matters in detail. The sadhana bhakti is divided into two categories, <coughs> vaidhi bhakti and raganuga bhakti. Vaidhi bhakti means you follow rules and regulations. 
do this, don't do this. More or less, follow these, this activity, avoid this activity. In Sanskrit, it's called anukulena and pratikul. This is favorable, this is unfavorable. Practice in your daily life and develop a routine of regular practice. When this is done regularly through the process of bhakti and, here's the important part, and in the association of others who are also doing it, then you come to the stage eventually of what is called Raganuga Bhakti. Raganuga Bhakti is explained by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu as the goal of bhakti. Simply following rules and regulations is a princess, is the process by which you get fixed in the process. But it must come to the stage of spontaneous. Spontaneous means one gets attracted to Krishna naturally. There's things in this world that attract us, right? Somebody talks about our favorite food, we get, okay, here we go, we're gonna get something like We get excited about that. Or we're gonna meet somebody who's very dear to us. There's a natural attraction to that. So the, we are naturally attracted to things in this world, but the natural attraction which is never changed is our natural attraction for Krishna. And that's called spontaneous devotional service. When then one reaches that stage, as, it, as it, the verses go on, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, that's, that's, that's uh, sadhana bhakti. And then when you get to the sixth verse, ayi nanda tu nuju kinkaram patita mam vishyame bhavam buddha kripayata vapada pankaja stita duli sadhisham vichiti. Nainam larada sruda reya vaddanam gadgara rudaya gira pulakaya nichitam bakut vidam tabanam agrihame bhavishiti. That's where Baba Bhakti starts or spontaneous devotional service. One starts to develop intense affection for the Lord that is not inhibited by any situation one might find themselves in. It's not dependent on anything external. It's coming from the heart. It's coming directly. And when that stage matures, even greater and deeper, as we study this process, it goes to the level of prema. And prema means pure love. That, that love that is pure and what we say not, not developed in any, there's no conditions on it. And these verses will explain it, especially the last three verses, especially the last two verses. So this whole process of, of the nine stages of bhakti are also aligned with these eight, these eight verses. So you see how scientifically Lord Chaitanya, in his mood of ecstasy, he, he chanted these verses not as a philosophical way to teach people, it was his ecstasies. Simply his ecstasies came out in the perfect transcendental knowledge. This is only God can do this. <laughs> it's not, it can be done by any conditioned soul. And here, here's an interesting statement also. Um, okay, where is it? I usually lose something somewhere. It's here, but it's here. This is interesting. Unless I can't find it. Okay. Okay. Too many papers. The mad, mad professor here. Well, somehow or other, I left it in the room. <laughs> but what it is, is that the first verse, let me say it in a different way. The Hare Krishna Maha Mantra and these verses are non-different. Now, when you say non-different, that doesn't mean different and non-different. It means simply non-different. 
The first verse is Hare Krishna. The second verse is Hare Krishna. The third verse is Krishna Krishna. The fourth verse is Hare Hare. <clears throat> the fifth verse is Hare Rama. The sixth verse, Hare Rama. The seventh verse, Rama, Rama. And the eighth verse, Hare Hare. So these eight verses are synonymous with the Maha Mantra. No different. So what I'm trying to emphasize is how powerful and how deep and how impossible it is to understand these eight verses. It'll take lifetimes just to break through it. But if we can get a little bit, because this knowledge, what will it do? It'll go help you to go deeper into the process of bhakti and also to go deeper into the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. When one chants the holy name of the Lord in a mood of absorption to, to the Lord, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> then the Lord appears in the mind of his devotee just to reciprocate his devotion. So that the name brings about awareness of Krishna's transcendental form. As one goes deeper into the chanting, then Krishna's transcendental pastime, no, I'm sorry, qualities, his characteristics, his amazing qualities, which are described in the scriptures, also become manifested in the mind and the heart of a devotee. And then the ultimate and highest and complete principle is his pastimes. So much so that Srila Prabhupada would say, you can also take part in Krishna's pastimes, even while you're still in this material world, if you reach that stage of bhakti. <clears throat> and so this chanting of the holy name is really the essence of everything. We might say, well, why do we do anything else? Why do we read scripture? Why do we worship the deity? Why do we you know, do our different activities in devotional service? All of these are important and not dispensable. They're necessary because they fortify and solidify our chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, ultimately. They help us develop a deeper and more complete experience in chanting Hare Krishna. In other words, we come in contact with Krishna through his name in a very real way and not some theoretical way. And that's why Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, although he emphasized two things in his practice, he emphasized chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra and associating with and serving Vaishnavas. These two things he put as the, his mission in, in spreading Krishna consciousness. And then he added a third one after the third, and that was Jivadoya, preaching Krishna consciousness, or, or bringing others into the process of pure devotional service. And Bhupa Goswami, which is his chief, what we say, proponent of pure transcendental knowledge, heard from Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu at Halahabad for 10 days, the whole science of bhakti. And of course, he wrote most of it down in many of his scriptures, especially Bhakti Rasamrita Sutra Ujwal and Nilamani, and uh, other writings by Lagu Bhagavatam Rita, all by Srila Rupa Goswami. But in that, uh, what we say, explanation of the science, Lord Chaitanya emphasized five things. Chant the holy name and develop a taste, associate with and serve devotees. Just to associate with devotees, to be in the association of devotees is not association with devotees. It's, there's something there. But to be in the association of devotee means to serve the devotees. To be in the mood of serving the devotees, then you actually move, take in that association. Then you, are, then you experience what that, 
And your enthusiasm in the process of executing devotional service is a form of association with devotees. It's a form of serving the devotees. Because when you're enthusiastic in the process, you send a nice message to everyone else. And that also inspires them in the same way. So that, so Mahaprabhu made that one of his main principles to associate with and serve the devotees. The third thing he said, Srimad Bhagavatam, Nasta Prayeshu Abhijreshu Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya, Bhagavati Uttama Sloke Bhakti Bhavati Naistiki. Every day, hear Srimad Bhagavatam. Srimad Bhagavatam is an incarnation of Krishna himself in transcendental sound vibration. Bhagavatam really explains the glories of the holy name by delineating Shila, Krishna's pastimes in his different incarnations, ultimately coming with the highest and most perfect and the most deepest of the, of the relationships Krishna and Sri Vrindavan Dham, which is actually the goal of our movement, to come to that consciousness of entering into that mood of devotion. And that is taught by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and emphasized in Srimad Bhagavatam itself, especially in the later verses of Bhagavatam. And then, of course, worshiping the Lord in his transcendental form. Deity worship is for two types of devotees. The, the brand new devotees who don't have an understanding so much of, of the process of devotional service, but can see the Lord in his transcendental form as the deity. That, that is preliminary to help them get situated and to understand that I can serve the Lord in his mood of, in his position as a deity, and I'm actually developing a relationship. But then, for the highest devotee, those who have reached a certain level of perfection in devotional service, they worship the deity in pure love. And they, don't, they see the deity and the holy name as being non-different. They experience the holy name and the deity as being non-different because Krishna manifests himself in his different aspects of himself. And the highest aspect of himself, at least the mercy higher, from the point of mercy, the highest is the holy name. But it's non-different than the deity and the deity is non-different from the holy name. And those who worship the deity in the proper mood of loving devotion to the deity will see that the worship of the deity and the chanting of the Hare, the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra are not different. And they'll see within the heart of that deity is, is all living entities. Therefore, they don't, they worship others. In other words, they serve the devotees because they know that service to the devotees is also service to the Lord, and service to the Lord is also service to the devotees. This is the nature of the absolute principle of spiritual essence, in other words, spiritual tattva, or truth, that everything is non-different. But the, the means, the, you, might, you might say the catalyst, the elixir, the, the ingredients that brings that realization Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare. So we hope to explore verse by verse this important process of pure devotional service through these eight verses. There's so much to say. I won't begin. I won't. I won't begin to get into the details of the first verse, which is a very powerful verse and sets the stage for the whole process. We'll begin tomorrow and during the Bhagavatam time period. And uh, um, please come. <laughs> and we would try to, if you can, as much as you can, not if you can, you should. <laughs> Please come to the morning program, and because the morning program is is really a, a way to awaken our spiritual taste by associating with devotees. It's a, it's a great way to start the day. <laughs> okay, so there's uh, maybe a few minutes left before our next 
activities? Is there any Sri Devi? 